We've been talking a lot about finished bourbons and finished whiskeys on the show, and if you find that process interesting, you're going to love what we have today. Today, I've got Seth Benheim on the show. He's the founder of Broken Barrel Whiskey. Now, if you haven't heard of them, you're about to hear a lot about them, and that's because their finishing process is pretty unique. They don't finish their whiskey in used barrels or sherry barrels or wine barrels. Nothing that simple. They actually developed what they call an oak bill, and they break up barrels, and they throw the staves into the whiskey as it is finishing so that it gets more flavor from more oak surface area, and also they can tune how they're finishing it by using this percent of this type of oak and this percent of this type of oak, which we do talk about in the show, and I review a couple of their whiskeys. So if that sounds interesting to you, I think you're really in for a treat. We had a great time talking talking about all the different aspects that go into developing a whiskey's flavor profile and how Seth came up with this idea for Broken Barrel. So without further ado, I'm going to cut to my interview with Seth Benheim from Broken Barrel. I have here with me uh, Seth Benheim from Broken Barrel. Seth, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yes, of course. And I do have the uh, samples we talked about tasting just to make sure, I believe you wanted to try the, the cask strength, right? So we'll be doing that one. I wanted you to try it. I've already had it. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you want yeah, to walk through. One. Okay. Okay. Yep. Cask strength. And then I also have with me here the uh, heresy, if we have time to go through that. Sure. Awesome. Those are the ones, yeah. Sounds good. But before we get to all the fun tasting, which is obviously the uh, the most fun part of this, I got to start with a question that I love to ask everybody. Where did your love of whiskey begin? That's a great question. Uh, I drank everything in college, so I can't say it started there. Um, I actually really liked making cocktails. Like I would make like floating cocktails like red, white, and blue and try to get the different weights of the liquid to like make pretty cocktail, like Jamaican flag or something like that, like stack colors and glasses. And I'd make drinks and cocktails for all the other people in my fraternity. And it was really fun. Um, so I always kind of loved booze, even from like way before I was legally allowed to drink it. I had a fake ID, the whole deal there. So I was always out, you know, taking the money I made and buying booze. Um, but my real love for whiskey, uh, I think it set in pretty quickly when I got started with our parent company and the company I founded, which was Infused Spirits, uh, which is a, a single bottle infused vodka brand. Um, one of the invest, the initial investor and one of my longtime partners was in the single malt scotch business. And so he'd been doing that for a um, decade and a half, basically. And so I got to drink really good, really good scotch, like 20, 30, 40 year old scotch when I was in my early 20s. And that just changed my whole world. Like when you start drinking, I, I once dropped the bottle and, you know, he, he looked at me, he goes, that's twice as old as you are. Oh my <laughs> gosh. He's a big, like six foot four Scotsman. So he was like, yeah, that's twice as old as you, son. Oh like, my. Oh. So, I mean, that was not all those days are like, you know, 11 years ago now, but, um, yeah, it's kind of how I cut my teeth in in this was I met a Scotsman, opened my eyes to Scotch whiskey. And, you know, from there I was working on vodka, but I was drinking whiskey at home and and helping sell whiskey out in the market and along with his son and, you know, other people that came along into the business. So yeah, that's where it all started with Scotch. Okay. And so do you still have a, a soft spot for scotch? I know you were showing me you've got oh, yeah. quite the uh, the collection over there, but you, you yeah. like a, a, do you lean towards any one area in Scotland or is it just all scotch? Sure, yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've been like dabbling a lot uh, more into peated scotch lately and, and spending a lot more money. Like I've been buying up every nice bottle of Lafroy I can find. Um, so I've got a nice collection and I've got about like 250 bottles of scotch or something like that. So Jeez. I love scotch, love, love, love scotch. I drink scotch constantly. I'd say scotch and bourbon are like, you know, which child do you like more? It's hard to answer, right? You know, you love them both inexplicably. Like there's, there's no limit to the love for both. They're just both perfect things to have in your glass. 
depending on the occasion, the company you're with, the food you're eating or are going to go eat, um, the weather, all these things could kind of dictate, oh, it'd be a nice, it's really cold and we're outdoors and a, a peated scotch sounds really nice. Or, you know, it's hot, it's a summer day, let's get a cast drink bourbon out, throw it on ice and just sit outside by the pool. You know, it's different occasions, I think, that would call for different drinks. So that sounds nice. Let's have one of those. So, yeah, it's, there's... It's all, it's all good. It's all, I love one guy, uh, on Instagram, I think goes by no bad whiskey. I love that. There is no bad whiskey. Yeah. Whiskey's for different occasions, I think. Yeah. I, I've said that before all the time. Cause I, you would get questions a lot. If you had to just pick one, if you had to pick bourbon, scotch or Irish or bourbon, scotch, rye, or yeah. what do you pick? And I'm like, I would be really sad if I had to pick just one <laughs> for the same reason you said, I mean, when it's fall and it's time for like a fire, I love a peated scotch. I mean that yeah. it just goes so perfectly with the with oh, yeah. that well, time. Yeah, Irish whiskey behind you is like you know I love seeing that. I love people that are into good Irish whiskeys or into good scotches. I love Taiwanese whiskey, and I got really into Indian whiskey uh, thanks to a friend uh, who was working with Paul John and all that. So you know, it's just the more you're exposed to. I think ultimately, uh, I've said this couple times in the past on various you know interviews or, or recordings or whatnot but um i think the more you try the better you are at whatever it is you're doing so if you're making bourbon or if you're making like especially for us we finish whiskeys right and we break barrels and we do all that and so the finishing aspect like if you don't have any concept like you know i went to a sherry tasting i don't really drink that much sherry on its own uh it's really sweet it's like not my not my style like i love my wine but i'm not really a sherry drinker per se mm -hmm. um but you, it's good to try it all to kind of understand how it might work in context with a bourbon or a rye or an american whiskey or something that we might be making so you know we, we buy I, I when i before i did a tokai finish i went and bought a bottle of tokai i didn't have a lot of options of what to buy but i bought one that i could find nearby uh and tried it out and i'm like oh okay i, I could get i kind of get what this is you know it's not like i've tried 20 different tokai to be an expert on it um nor do i claim to be <laughs> but you know you do that right you yeah kind of yeah that is that that's really cool to hear i mean it's a good it's not <laughs> to be honest with you it's not something i thought about is you got to know you guys do some, which we're going to get to, some really crazy, you know, different finishes with your stave profiles and uh, your oak bill here. And uh, that's not something you really think about is, yeah, you need to know what you're expecting when you go to put it, a bunch of whiskey um, over top of those staves. Uh, so, yeah, that's a great point. Um so then, so if you, you're, you're into scotch and you've got your parent company, as you said, how did that lead you at what point were you like, I guess it's a chicken or the egg. Were you, you had this idea about broken barrels and you wanted to do whiskey or did you know you wanted to do something whiskey and then you came up with the broken barrel? The second one, uh, okay. we knew we wanted to make whiskey. And so in 2017, we put out a little, a small run of bourbon um, under the infused spirits, like moniker and, and packaging and all that. Um, we knew we weren't going to go after the single bottle infusion. I think that from day one was really like, uh, it was really going to change the course of what the whiskey would become because we ultimately splintered it off and made it into a completely separate brand altogether it has nothing to do with the parent company nothing to do with the single bottle infusions the word infuse is nowhere to be found just we got rid of it with broken barrel is its own thing the company is is broken barrel now i mean the whiskey sales totally overshadow the vodka sales it's totally done a, a 180 so you know we were joking about one day we'll be 50 50 it's like no it's like 70 30 now it's like we're killing the vodka sales uh with whiskey it just exploded in a way that we kind of joked about but now it's like beyond reality it's like this is the world we live in we're like yeah you no know, it just doesn't you know oh yeah and i think i think you can attribute a lot of that to the uniqueness of what you have going on and so i have to ask 
where, and you've probably answered this a hundred times, but where did the idea come from? So you're using broken barrels to finish whiskeys. Where did that come from? Uh, so um, it, first we knew we wanted to use oak and do something uh, akin to an infusion or, or a maceration where we were going to take pieces and soak them in the whiskey from the very first, hey, if we're going to do whiskey, it's got to be principally taking something and putting it into a whiskey and then changing it, whether it was going to be like we were even we were day one, we were thinking, is it going to be chips, cubes, uh, spirals, staves? And then when we came up with the concept, so we, we got used, we were actually cutting up used bourbon barrels, um, cutting up uh, new French oak, cutting up sherry casks. And we were, we had like Gatorade jugs and we filled them up with whiskey and we did one with one kind of oak, one with another and one with the third. And then we would do like 30, 30, 33, 33. We did 40, 40, 20. We did, you know, 25, 25, 50. We did different combinations. Then we tried those at different proofs. And then that's how we got to 95 proof. Um, and the original oak bill, which was 40% French, 40% ex bourbon, 20% sherry. And that became our small batch bourbon uh, that we still have today. Same proof, same recipe, uh, just older whiskey and <laughs> better whiskey for that matter from when we started. Thank God. Um, <laughs> I mean, again, we started with like nine month old whiskey when we were when we launched in 2017 as the distillery we were sourcing from in Owensboro got older and had older whiskey. We got older whiskey from them and our whiskey got older and older. So the first one was just bourbon. It wasn't even straight bourbon. And then and over time, it became straight bourbon and, and got better and better. So, OK. Yeah, so it, it evolved a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. So then, um, is it still, if I remember correctly, is it entirely sourced or is it only partially sourced now? You have some distillery? Everything is sourced. We Everything's are not sourced. a distillery. We don't, we don't need to be. Um, we're working, so we've sourced from MGP for a few projects. We've mm -hmm. sourced our entire core lineup of rye and bourbon is coming from Green River, Owensboro Distilling Company. Um, we have purchased and just did a collaboration with Los Angeles distillery because we're here. I've known the guy for years. Uh, he's a phenomenal, phenomenal distiller. Uh, we were named uh, top 13 bourbons outside of Kentucky with that release uh, back in January, which was exciting. So um, we've sourced a lot of interesting whiskeys, uh, types, I should say, from MGP, from single malt wheat whiskey, corn whiskey, light whiskey. Uh, we've worked with a variety of types, rye whiskey. Um, and then of course a weeded bourbon was the one we did from uh, LA distillery. So, I mean, we've put out in terms of types, like six or seven types of whiskey already, all American whiskey. And then uh, our core lineup is, is the Green River stuff. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how, we, how we've done it so far, but we can source from anywhere. Like we could source from Colorado single mall, we could source, uh, you know, Texas, something, something we could source Washington, Florida, you name it. Like there's no limit to where we could get the whiskey from. And that's the fun part. I think about what we have and can and will continue to do is there's no limits. There's no restrictions. There's no boundaries that we have to adhere to that. A lot of brands like, you know, I'm not picking on them. I think their whiskey is phenomenal, but like Wyoming whiskey isn't going to get whiskey from Texas and put it in their bottle because it's called Wyoming whiskey. Like when right. you put the name of where you're from in the title of your brand, you know, it's there. And then the problem becomes like, if you're, I don't know, Nashville barrel company or something, but whiskey's from Indiana, I don't know. Most people won't care. I don't think it matters really that much personally, but I could see people being like, Oh, what the hell? This says Nashville, but it's Indiana. This is weird. You know, oh, old yeah. Louisville from Indiana, right? Like <laughs> it just gets a little, it gets a little confusing at times or something. I don't know. Yeah. It, 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 it can happen. I'm not saying it matters. I'm not saying I care, but I think they're, they you pigeonhole concepts a little bit for, for like some of the emerging whiskey geeks and nerds that get really into this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think they can find issue with that. So 
luckily we don't have that problem or have to deal with that. So it's somewhat uh, good on our part. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. I mean, I remembered reading up on the site and it said it was at least, I knew for sure it was at least partially sourced. And I love the transparency with that because like you said, you don't want people to feel betrayed. Um, mm-hmm. And I've said uh, many times on, on my show when source whiskey comes up, people love, it's like a hot topic. People love to ask, are you, you know, do you yeah. hate source whiskey? And I always say no. And the reason I give, I think lends itself really well to broken barrel, because I always say, you know, there, there is something to taking years and years and fine tuning your mash bill, fine tuning your distillation process, fine tuning uh, your aging. But there's also some, a, a level of freedom that we have now where we can fine tune blending and doing, and at the time, this is before I had uh, spoken with you, I would just say like doing weird things, just doing things that haven't been done before. And right. if it wasn't for sourced whiskey, I think it's fair to say we probably wouldn't have broken barrel right now. And it's a totally think, new idea. Yeah. I don't think you'd have a lot of the innovation, which can actually come off in some instances as copying the big guys uh, from the little guys. The big guys copying, you know, oh, I, you don't always see like the most innovative things happening over at some of these larger, um, more corporate or publicly owned, uh, distilleries, you know, they play it pretty safe, pretty close, you know, traditional, you know, by the keep it close to the chest kind of thing. And then the crazy ones like us, or, or I don't know, anyone else that's doing really wild finishes, wild processes, you know, aging it on a river or, you know, you get these or at sea or something like that. Like you get these wild ideas. Um, and then the big guys go, ah, oh, we either need to add that to our line. So like Basil Hayden toast or Basil Hayden red wine wouldn't exist if all these craft distillers or craft sourcing or blenders or whatever didn't get wild and crazy and start, you know, um, doing different things and trying different things. So I think it definitely influences uh the industry as a whole when the little guys take risks or do weird i I love weird weird is perfect weird is like where it's at for me because i if i just want to drink 800 different versions of the same thing you know why what's the point like why did why do we need to exist if we're just going to put more of the same stuff out there as everyone else i couldn't agree more yep yeah i i love uh i was talking about this um uh, with blind barrels, I believe that it is, it's, it's awesome because you have with sorts whiskey, you have the freedom to do these weird things. And maybe let's just say maybe 70, 80% of them end up just tasting funky, but every once in a while you hit the nail on a head with something that's strange. It's not like anything anybody's ever had and it tastes good. And yeah. the fact that the industry, like you said, even the big guys wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for the little guys who have the freedom to do this. The fact that the industry has that freedom now is pretty awesome. So you uh, you mentioned you had the chips. You'd put like chips or, or cubes or slice up staves and put them into uh, bottles for aging. So at what point – so if you could, for those listening who don't know, break down how exactly you use the broken barrels to infuse the whiskey yeah. and how you arrived at that. Absolutely. And, and to clarify, we don't use chips. We don't use cubes. We don't use – sawdust or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. um, we use whole intact barrels for the most part. Uh, we have purchased on occasion uh, flat staves that would be formed into barrels, uh, but have not been. But we generally are buying like X bourbon barrels, X rye barrels, X sherry casks, um, rum barrels, peach brandy barrels, uh, maple barrels honey barrels we've done uh amontillado sherry barrels we've done isla scotch barrels we've done um we've done amberana one time we're not like promoting like we're the next amberana guys or whatever like i I think it's kind of too too trendy so i kind of we did one but i'm not like advertising it really um anymore but uh oloroso sherry all, all these beautiful casts we've done uh, done so many different kinds and the concept when they come in um and are are whole intact 
what was really fun the first time we ever did it was like how do we kind of illustrate broken barrel like let's smash a barrel with a sledgehammer so we did um and then it just became our thing and and then it became a symbol of the company and now we have the cross axes and hammers which actually have those exact hammers here uh and like we literally have <laughs> at all times like axes and hammers uh like and they're we use them like they're they're beat to shit, man i mean these yeah are gnarly uh because we use them all the time because we actually are smashing up barrels literally and we are taking the staves um and submerging them into the the whiskey so it's the staves are bobbing and floating around in a pool of whiskey for uh anywhere from at the lowest lowest like 30 days and you got to remember it's the inside and the outside of the barrel so at a minimum it's twice the amount of oak in contact with the whiskey which does have an effect if anyone's ever listening um that has done like a at home secondary barrel like a countertop barrel or you bought some staves and you stuck it like I've, there have been some companies that put out spirals mm -hmm. that you can add to your your cheap whiskey to make it taste older or better um really you're just making it taste woodier in some sense uh depending on the type of oak it is and but a lot of our barrels have had something else in them uh that we're sourcing so we are extracting those flavors as well as you know the seasoned wood that is the exterior of the barrel and so barrel preparation what coopers do is they use oak that has been seasoned which is effectively it's been left outside and while it sounds maybe a little gross or dirty or unclean what's happening is that the oak is actually uh gaining complexity and characteristics from the weather from the external from like the microorganisms and biology of what's happening to the wood and so that is actually building up things like tannins and it's actually creating uh, flavorful oak to be used for barrels. Um, burning it, charring it, in our case, sometimes washing it uh, will clean off any kind of imperfections or things you don't want in the whiskey. But then ultimately, seasoned oak is an important. I mean, E.H. Taylor will sell you a seasoned wood uh, <laughs> bottle for like $800, right? Again, yeah. mostly marketing, I think. But you know, it, it's an important factor. So all of the contact and surface area of oak to whiskey is why we don't age, you know, too long for fear of over oaking or losing that, that kind of subtle balance that we're after. So there's a, there's a science to it and, and also an art to it as well. <clears throat> yeah. I imagine a lot of, uh, in the beginning, at least a lot of trial and error went into, you know, doing smaller batches and just seeing what happened. Yeah, uh, with the exception of like what, what I call the original oak bill, which was that 40, 40, 20. Mm -hmm. That was our first, and we still use it today on the cast strength and the rye that you'll taste and our small batch. So and it seems a little boring to have three of our four core whiskeys, call it, uh, with the same oak bill. But, I mean, that rye whiskey's won like 93 points five different times in the last year. It's won a double gold in San Francisco. It's like doing really well. Like why, why knock it? And then the cal and the cast strength. Um, this is like the highlight of the whole award atmosphere for us or, or universe. Would be we picked up uh, from the World Whiskey Awards. We picked up the Kentucky Best Finished uh, Bourbon. So we're the best finished bourbon out of Kentucky in the World Whiskey Awards, which is awesome. I mean, you have so many big players and you know companies that i love and respect and buy their products and man to, to be up there with them um and recognized for that was really 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 cool this past february so we're still kind of like on cloud nine from that we're just putting our you know marketing stuff together to talk about that but on top of that our brand as a whole was named uh the most innovative whiskey brand in america as well so we wow. got the brand innovator of the year, which was really, really cool to be recognized for, you know, the risks we took in doing things differently. You know, whiskey's pretty uh, cultured and pretty traditional and pretty uh, historical. So to come in swinging hammers and like, we're going <laughs> to fucking do it our way. And like, who cares what anyone else thinks? It was a little risky, like, you know, to just do something. And people said, I don't know if that's going to work. Or that's heresy, you know, one person told us. And I'm like, yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to use that. Ah, so, that makes I mean, sense. Yeah, 
that's kind of how that all was born. So we're, we're really, really honored and really, really humbled to have been recognized for kind of the risk taken. And, and we say we are risk takers and barrel breakers. And it's kind of, uh, I think people are liking that, I guess. So it's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm for <laughs> I mean, I, I can't think of anything. You mentioned the innovation. I can't think of anything quite as outside of the box lately i mean you've got you know toasted barrels are becoming you know more popular and you've got uh different finishes but combining different types of barrels and using as you mentioned the more surface area the whole stave that's uh that's pretty ins- i mean that's pretty awesome to to have come up with that and to uh, have taken it as far as you said to to try all these different oak bills. So for people who don't know, you guys, another thing that I love, I love when a mash bill is disclosed, and then you have your oak bill, which is really yeah. interesting. I mean, it adds a whole other layer to it. Yeah. Um, so each each of these has the mash bill and the oak bill on it. And so for those listening who haven't seen this before, it says right here, I got the, the barrel strength uh, bourbon here. corn, 21% rye, 9% malted barley. So that's your mash bill. That's your your bare bones recipe of the actual whiskey. But then you guys take it a step further with your oak bill, and you've got 40% ex-bourbon, 40% new French oak, and 20% sherry cask oak. So I, it's because I'm a geek, but I love when I know all the, the intricacies of what it went into making something taste the way that it tastes. And so when I noticed that on the sample bottle, I was like, oh, that's really cool. Because now it's like you get to try them side by side and see, you know, what you like more about each one. Yeah, we, we are very, very happy to discuss and disclose what oak was used. Uh, um, you know, we're trying to get deeper with our partnerships now that we're growing. You know, we can hopefully cement some ongoing long-term partnerships for the sources of the French oak, for the sources of, you know, our Cabernet barrels, for our Cabernet cask finish Mm -hmm. um, that we do. You know, I'd love to be able to, uh, what's the word here? Uh, Now I'm blanking. Uh, I'd love to be able to like pay back or mention or credit uh, the producer of either the spirit that went into the barrel we used Mm -hmm. or if it's a new barrel the barrel maker themselves so i think Mm -hmm. something you'll see from us in the years to come are like hyper details or like like micro details like we have the macro covered in terms of information but i want to strive to have micro like covered even if it's not on the bottle maybe on the website or something where people can really nerd out and like get into oh you know this oak was this barrel was seasoned uh for 18 months outdoors before it went into this wine or this vintage of wine was in it and really give detailed information. Uh, so, and we're working on the website, we're putting in like new attributes, like more uh, direct to consumer, um, more, what's it called, uh, store finders. So we're gonna have like every retailer, every bar, every restaurant that we're in is going to upload in real time. So if a case is shipped from a wholesaler, to a retailer, it'll immediately trigger to our website, like in real time. So we're happy to have that um, synced up with like our, our our sales and software portal. So really cool things coming to our website, as well as like flavor wheels. So you can see like, is this a dry whiskey? Is it a sweet whiskey? Is it a uh, strong whiskey? Is it a woody whiskey? Like all these different flavor wheels and components. We got together and we put these tasting notes together and then graph them so people can kind of see what directions um, the whiskey profiles, not just for the current, but for every whiskey we've ever made, uh, okay. which are listed on the website. Um, but I've long, there, we did a lot of one-offs and a lot of like limited editions that are hard to find or don't exist anymore. But if you do make it to LA ever, or anyone listening makes it to our tasting room, um, we have, you know, at least for now, we have uh, everything we've ever made. Wow. So we can taste it by the glass. You can't buy it, but you can taste it. So we do offer that here. I'd like to make it kind of cool to come here yeah, um, and give that experience. Because I've been to a lot of distilleries now. And my least favorite thing is 
You can't try anything special. You can't buy anything special. You know, here's our everyday stuff that you could find at your local Total Wine back, you know, two miles from your house when I just drove like three hours from the airport to get to you. Like, <laughs> thanks for nothing. So yeah. I hate that. So I tried to make it special here um, in addition to like all the other stuff we have uh, in the library. But it's it's a fun spot. So. Wow. I mean, yeah, anybody, anybody listening who's been listening for a while knows that that, uh, that all sounds awesome to me. I mean, the ability to geek out on the website, I always bring that up when I'm doing a review because I love having that. Not only do I love it from like the geek half of me loves being able to look at that stuff, but then also, you know, the second half of my podcast name noobs, I love that it's so helpful for newer people who don't know what sherry finish tastes like. They don't know what Cabernet finish tastes like. And you, when you can geek out and learn those things, you can start to pick up kind of those patterns. Uh, so that, that sounds pretty great to be honest with you, which would bring me speaking of the patterns to, to that main Oak bill that you talked about. So you're 40, 40, 20, 40% ex bourbon, 40% new French Oak, 20% Sherry Oak. Were you going for a specific profile when you guys were doing your initial tests in, in the bottles? Were you going for a specific profile? Were you trying a few different things and just seeing what tasted good? And how did you know when you would land it on a good one? Yeah, everyone will the answer the second part of that question first. We knew because everyone voted, like, what the hell did we just drink? <laughs> we all looked at each other like, this was the best one, right? And everyone's like, yeah, it was by far. Uh, we tried, we all thought going into it, we would like a lot of sherry on the bourbon. Uh, and so <clears throat> like 50% sherry. And it actually wasn't the case because bourbon's already kind of sweet, relatively speaking. Um, it, it because it picks up so much. Uh, it, first of all, it's corn, which has the impression of sweeter. It's not always true, but it has the impression of being sweeter and grainier. But it also it, at least for the case of the whiskey we were sourcing and, and using for the blend uh, for batch one, when we were picking this stuff, was it. it too much sherry, it got too sweet. And so we dialed the sherry back and we actually wanted to, when we were drinking a lot of, at the time, I think we were drinking a lot of like double oaked or, you know, um, double barrel, like Jim Beam and, and Woodford and stuff like that were very popular. I mean, you got to go back like seven years, six, seven years. When we were first thinking of doing this, like we were tinkering for like a year before we launched anything. Um, and we were trying to find partners. We were turned down a lot. People were like, we're not going to break barrels with hammers with you guys <laughs> or like put oak into our tanks or our, our totes or anything. Like we're not going to mess up our equipment to do that. So we got turned away by a few people um, before we found partners. And we were sourcing, you know, um, samples from like MGP and other companies at the time trying to figure it out. Uh I think it really clicked too when we I finally got to go about six, eight months after buying the first few barrels from Green River. I actually went there. They were OZ Tyler at the time. Okay. Uh, they weren't uh, Green River then. And when I saw the distillery and its heritage, and I thought it was a really cool backdrop for what we're doing, which is all kind of new age, like never been done modern style of whiskey it was really cool to have this distillery that was one of the oldest in the country and in, in Kentucky. I was like, wow, this is kind of a neat little like piece to kind of feather in your cap to say, Hey, we're buying whiskey from this distillery from like it's been around since 1885 and you know, it's DSP number 10. That's kind of a cool, I mean, that's not the top 10 things I would talk about in our whiskey, but if people ask, you know, it's good to have that, as a backdrop, I think there's so much other stuff going on with Broken Barrel that it really overshadows that fact or those details. But when you, st you know, in, in formats like this where we can really get into detail, mm -hmm. it's cool to know. It's like, yeah, you know, and people are really enjoying Green River's whiskey. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other brands that are sourcing from them. Again, it's like it, they're not, they're a fraction of the number of brands that are sourced from call MGP, relatively speaking. But yeah, and still, the, 
overall, people are really loving their whiskey in the formats it's been offered. And we're really happy to offer it in our own format and in our own way. And it's performing incredibly well uh, as a result of the things we decided to do with it and other people's whiskey for that matter, not just theirs. But it's it's really fun. And I'm enjoying that. So, yeah. Yeah, and to 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 talk about what I am tasting here, um, yeah, I I think you hit the nail on the head with not being too sweet, um, and that is something that's very important. I think it's what makes it shine uh, amongst competitors is that it is you know quote unquote finished bourbon, but it's not um, so aggressively finished that it tastes like you mixed a glass of wine and in, into a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> you know, sometimes you'll have that, and yeah. The uh, the oakiness really shines through, and I hadn't really put it together till you mentioned how you have the backside of this, Dave. It's also in there, but it, it it balances it out really well with the sweetness of the sherry. So I'm personally getting like a little bit of like a fruitiness, a little bit of like a sweetness, uh, but I'm also getting you said wood for double oaked, and that actually reminds me of it a little bit. I'm getting this oaky little bit of a little bit of a tannic flavor um and still some of that vanilla and that spice that you typically get from from the oak i think vanilla is prevalent on pretty much all the core whiskeys um i'm talking our california oak which is the wine finish uh our small batch our cast strength which is basically the small batch with a higher octane and our rye i think it's just something that is true of the green river bourbons and ryes that there's a lot of vanilla, pretty heavy, especially in in the more youthful year uh, barrels. They're really, really heavy up on vanilla. I think the double oak element is is created by using the uh, bourbon barrels. I think the French oak brings in a really nice, almost like creme brulee style, you know, brown sugar a little bit. It brings in some really nice flavors as well, um, nuttiness as well. And then the sherry is just like this great dark red fruit like you know plums and uh, cherries and all those kind of but it's like at the end it's not the first thing you taste it's not the last thing you taste but it's in there floating around amongst all these other components and that's the fun part is the whiskey kind of takes you on this ride of like "Mm, i'm getting a little double oak maybe it reminds me of wood oh no no it's changing it's doing this other thing now and oh now i'm getting a little more like Davies County, French Oaky. No, I'm getting like that heavy sherry. You know, now I'm back to the Woodford again. Like you kind of go for these waves. I love that because it's not not every whiskey is going to offer that journey on the palate or like on the tongue, um, which is you know it's created by multiple staves finishing the whiskey in tandem at once in one vessel or vat, and that's the difference. I think is you know a lot of people will age the whiskeys in different barrels and then blend them afterwards or transfer from one barrel to the next barrel um all of which can be either expensive um and is that's why some whiskeys that would offer a similar profile will cost you 60 70 80 90 100 dollars when we're really proud really happy to offer this stuff at you know 50 ish or less and that's the that's the whole concept is giving value, cool package, great drinkable whiskey, meant to be opened, meant to be drink and, and or drank and shared, not, you know, put away in a cabinet, like, look at this bottle I got, I'm never going to open it. <laughs> like, that's not really what we're after. Uh, so, yeah, you're totally right about the journey it takes you on. And that I think is something that is, um, it is aided by if you've had the different things that you mentioned. If you've had a double oaked and you've had something with French oak and you've had something, I, I don't know if I've ever even had a bourbon with a sherry finish, but definitely Scotch and Irish whiskey heavy on the sherry finishes. Yeah. If you can pull those out, then you're totally right. Your brain picks them up at different spots in the palate. You know, it's 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 picking up. Oh, now I'm picking up the oakiness, and now I I can see. You know, it's very different from a sherried scotch, but I can see the sherry coming through in it. Uh, it lends itself to some serious complexity. Um, and then I think there were two things that you said that was like, you know, could be could be bias, confirmation bias, could just be that you're spot on, which, you know, something tells me you've tasted this a couple times. <laughs> um, but you said the creme brulee. 
Um, and then you said like the dark fruit. And it, to me, I was almost thinking like berries, but uh, yeah, the cherry, the plum, um, and and creaminess like a creme brulee, balanced yeah. out by like a spice. It's not like if you've ever had where it's it's too creamy, it almost bogs down your palate. It's like it's balanced out with that little bit of that spice and that that sure. oakiness from the barrels. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, we always like to, and this started with the vodkas in the early days, like 11, 12 years ago, when we were thinking of how we were going to go about it. Like it always had to taste really balanced. Um, and so we'll drink, we'll drink it at low proofs. We'll drink it with adding water. We'll drink it with ice, make cocktails with it. Um, all of which we, we fully intend and want people to do. I mean, if it gets priced, Hopefully it doesn't price too many people out. I mean, obviously there are high proof and, you know, low proof versions of almost every price point, 15 bucks and up. You can start to pretty much find most whiskeys. So a lot of people will be making cocktails with 15, 20, $25 bottles. Um, but then there's a whole the people out there buying two, $300 bottles of bourbon would probably have no issue making a drink or making a Manhattan or making an old fashioned Boulevardier, you know, with our rye or with our cast strength bourbon, you know, at 35, 40 bucks a bottle. It's like, yeah, why not? I mean, that's for a lot of people that is cocktail price range. And I have, I'm like not one of those, I'm not too proud to say, Oh no, this is not meant to be mixed or like, no, go ahead. Like mix the crap out of it. <laughs> like for, make a punch bowl with it. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but it's, I think it's actually a great option for cocktails, um, despite how complex and nuanced some of these whiskeys really are, and and you need to taste them neat to really appreciate that. I think they're also high proof, uh, not uh, off balance, and so they will make a great cocktail as well, um, at least on that subject. So it's definitely uh, from the, from the founder to the people listening. <laughs> Go ahead, make a cocktail. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> drink the way you like it, right? The way you like yeah. it is the best way to drink it. And like you mentioned, you mean it'd be hard to pick up the nuance in a cocktail, but especially if you're making a whiskey forward cocktail, it is so unique. Especially, I mean, I've, I've tried each of the core lineups so far, and, and they all have something different that at least I imagine that uniqueness will come through in the cocktail. And it'll be like, well, this definitely wasn't made with my, you know, with the $20 bourbon from my local liquor shop. Yeah, it starts to, like, I like the rye almost by far and away for cocktails. I like the 105 proof because you're in a really good spot at that proof point uh, to taste, you know, that it is, you know, if you do a 40% rye cocktail and a 40% bourbon cocktail and it's got more than two ingredients and it starts getting shaken and all that, by the time you drink it, you don't even know, you couldn't even tell if it was Irish whiskey. It just tastes like water at that point um, to some degree, it, depending mm -hmm. on, again, the cocktail and whatnot. But with our rye, you really taste the, the rye aspects, some of that mintiness. You really kind of penetrates. Uh, and almost most cocktails, you, the classic cocktails, you'd be making with it. The first tasting we just did, for those who don't remember, it was the cask strength finished bourbon. So I did move on to the rye, Heresy, yep. Kentucky Straight Rye Whiskey. And um, a lot of what you mentioned is totally true. The other thing I want to mention, so you mentioned you still get the rye notes. Uh, you still get you get like a little bit of mintiness comes through. It always has to me like a grassy, herbal uh, feel to it. And then with rye sometimes, it's hard to get oakiness with the rye for me and maybe it's just my palate um and i like that you do still get some oakiness with it you it balances it out a little bit um to where you're still you can still taste a little bit of that uh, just a little of that oak spice and it goes well uh with the rye i've only had a couple sips so far right now but that's what i remember from my last tasting that i had of it yeah that's it's um it's the one my wife drinks the most is the rye. She's a fanatic for it. So she is, uh, she knows it, for, she can pull it out of a blind tasting uh, with with near perfection, which always shocks me because she, like, you know, you'll pour stuff for her and she'll be like, uh, is this a bourbon or a rye? I had no idea. But she goes, oh, this is the heresy. And I'm like, how do you, how do you do that? Wow, yeah. 
she just knows the profile of it. And I, I think that kind of speaks to its differences between other rise and just other whiskeys in general. Um, and again, you know, I, I, the, the talking point, you know, from a marketing standpoint is always going to be cast strength, you know, best Kentucky rye finished 2023. But I mean, like more technically speaking, our rye has been our consistently best performing skew period. Like it just does um, incredibly well. It got, again, 593 point scores last year. Um, the great value award from Ultimate Spirits, Double Gold San Francisco. It just does incredibly well. And everything we, we throw it throw it into, it just comes out a winner um, and at the top of, you know, the scores for us. So it's our most awarded whiskey, even though it's not the highest awarded whiskey. And then, you know, I think if you're a rye person, we've got something phenomenal for you at a great price. If you're a cast strength bourbon person, we've got something phenomenal for you at a great price. So yeah. we can we can offer both uh, types of, of those consumers something really uh, fun and, and great to taste. Yeah. I mean, rye has been growing on me, especially recently. Um, and I would say that even, even if other rye, if you haven't been a fan of them, it almost the, the oakiness that I mentioned almost tames down a little bit of what I get in some other rye, which is almost a little bit, a little bit chemically, a little bit bitter sometimes from a rye. Uh, and that, that tames it down a little bit. And I get, um, you know, the, the sweet forward notes along with that rye herbal, uh, flavor as well. So it, it has a nice balance to it, I guess, is the, the summary of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's awesome to hear. Um, I think you and, and, and other folks I've met, um, who have really great channels, great content. I think that comes not just from like, it's not, it's, it's the opposite of snobbery. It's, it's a, a passion for this industry and, and these products and, and this, these categories of, of whiskeys and stuff. So it's, it's always like your opinion and opinions like yours are the ones that I'm, I'm super interested in hearing um, because you are so well experienced in all of this and folks like you and I would say myself and others drink a ton of whiskey and a ton <laughs> of other things. And like you, after you've tried so much, you start to go, oh, man, this is really good. And you know, I come back, oh, I'm always coming back to inexpensive whiskeys that I just love. And people go, oh, have you tried this, you tried that? And I, yeah, I have, but I would just get this other, I'd get four bottles of this other product before I bought one of those. And I just find myself you get, the, I'm sure you get those calls from friends and family who know you're Mr. Whiskey to them, right? And they're like, hey, Chris, I'm at the store. What do I buy? Oh you know, my I, gosh, yes. Don't buy that. Buy two of these instead. I, you get that call every weekend or every <laughs> yeah. holiday or whatever. Like, everyone's at the store. What do I buy? Yep. And if it's a special occasion, they're just looking at the top shelf. They're looking behind the counter. It's like, you don't oh, got to yeah. do all that. You don't have to do all that. Put, put your checkbook yeah. away. It's not, it's not like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I get those exactly. calls all the time. I actually did a video about that. You said buying like four instead of one with like Johnny Walker blue versus Johnny Walker black. And you mentioned you're a scotch guy. I'm curious. Have you, yeah. have you tried the two side by side at all? Or what's your opinion on those two? I don't, I can't say I've I've uh, tried them side side by side uh, in recent memory, but I have polished off a bottle of blue that I think my dad got it as a gift, and he doesn't drink, so he's just like, uh, "Here, son, take this." And I'm like, "Okay, wow, <laughs> no, no, uh, no arguments there. I'll take the blue label." Yeah. Um, but no, I mean Johnny Walker to my memory because I don't drink too much of that. Uh, I always liked double black. I thought it was like, really good for the price. And I always liked um, like Johnny Walker 18 is not terrible. I have a bottle of that. There's a platinum. Oh, give a dog. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, the, yeah, that's, those are the ones I've, I've got more experience with, so to speak. But yeah, no, I mean, I've, no, I haven't tried it side by side, but I imagine the point is that 
they're probably negligibly different and it's probably better to get like six of one than one of the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so don't get me wrong. Free Johnny Walker blue is a delicious scotch. I mean, it's great, yeah. but uh, yeah, side by side, it is not, it's not enough of a difference to, to merit. I think it's seven, at least in Ohio, seven bottles of black label you could get for the price yeah. of blue label. <laughs> just or doesn't... even I would say to add to that, I'd say like three or four bottles of double black, which is I think superior to black, red, yep. maybe even green, you know, don't chase the age statement. Like if it's a really good, well-balanced blended scotch, like go for it, man. Why not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I, I think, uh, I think I covered the two tastings that I wanted to do, and um, we covered a lot Which of ground. Which did you like more? Which did you like more? Oh man, oh that's we talked about. If I had to give up bourbon or if I had to give up scotch, I'm so bad at picking one over the other. Rye or yeah, rye or bourbon. Um, oh, so I have with me the normal rye, and I have the cask strength bourbon. And I think I like the cask strength better, but that is that 115 is like my proof. That's like I really yeah. enjoy a 115. So if I had cask strength rye, this might be a different story. But I'll probably go okay. with the bourbon for that for that reason. I love I love Woodford Double Oak, um, and I love a little bit of sherry in like a um, a single malt. And I, I think that's really neat that I get somehow both of those in the same glass, which is a weird thing to even nice. say. Yeah. <laughs> happy, happy to have offered it. Happy to have, have put that together for you and others, you know, to yeah. enjoy. So that's awesome. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I, you know, that covers most of my show notes here. But um, if I could just ask you another quick question, I've been I've been asking a little bit extra and then just showing it to my patrons because they do pay a little bit extra for the extra content. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything else that I didn't cover that you wanted me to cover or even coming up that you would like to to disclose or like to talk about uh, prior to? Us I going? would end by saying uh, follow us on Instagram where a lot of release news, upcoming events, product releases, um, tastings at liquor stores. That's always a great spot to kind of check our stories. So at Broken Barrel Whiskey, our website, which I, we've talked about a little bit, is getting totally like uh amplified in terms of what it's going to share and information so brokenbarrelwhiskey.com um and we have facebook tiktok you can follow us there which generally just gets info from instagram and then yeah we'll be at the bourbon festival in september in, in bardstown we'll be at bourbon on the banks i believe it's in frankfurt but don't quote me on that in october uh we'll be at a handful of other events that I can't think of at the moment, but I think we're going to go back to like Wisconsin whiskey festival. Like we do a lot of these kind of fun festivals in the second half of the year. So second half, 2023, you'll see us out there. Uh, come taste some whiskey and come visit us. If you're in LA, uh, really, if you like whiskey and you're in Los Angeles on vacation or you live here, you are missing out if you don't come down here. So definitely make your way down. Yes, I have seen what the tasting room looks like. You're missing out if you don't go check it out. And like he said, everything they've ever released. That I mean, everything you got to go give that a try. Yep. That's awesome. Definitely. All right. Well, Seth, thank you for taking the time out to talk with me. This has been very educational about your process and the stuff that you've tried. I mean, that's it's really great. And um, people have heard me geek out about other other innovations in the industry. So they know that I'm genuine when I say, I love what you're doing. I love the innovation. I find it super fascinating. Um, and now, now that I know that you want to even add the information for geeks like me to look up while they're tasting it, I think you're you're on the right track with that. And it, just my humble opinion from my my podcast, but everything I've tried has been great. Um, and Thanks. so Thank I you. I appreciate you talking with me. Thanks a lot, Chris. Yes, of course. Thank you as well, Seth. Alrighty, take care. You too. 
Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Whiskey Noobs. If you need more Whiskey Noobs content in your life, make sure you check out our Patreon page in the show notes. And if you like the show, please make sure to leave a five-star rating or review. It only takes a couple of minutes, and they're way more helpful than people realize. If you want to do tastings alongside the show, make sure you join the email list by sending an email to whiskeynoobspodcast at gmail.com with a subject line that says email list. You'll receive monthly emails with a list of the whiskeys that will be featured throughout the month so that you can buy them ahead of time you can also find more whiskey noobs content on instagram at whiskey underscore noobs and on tiktok at whiskey noobs podcast once again thank you guys for listening the whiskey noobs podcast does not support underage or otherwise irresponsible consumption of alcohol